folks, welcome to another Board Game Breakfast. If I'm a little tired, it's because I just got back from Board Game Geek Con, which was tremendous. It was so great to meet so many of those who came up and talked to me there at the convention. Uh, it was an entertaining convention. Uh, Board Game Geek Con has about 2,500 uh, attendees. It's held in Dallas each year, usually the week before American Thanksgiving. Uh, there's gamers from all over the world who show up there, different publishers come, there's exhibition halls, there's tournaments, and I had a, I had a great time. I actually got a decent amount of gaming played. Uh, the game that I enjoyed the most while there was probably Spyfall. I think I played that 15 times when I was there. Uh, I also really enjoyed Nations, the dice game, and there were several other games that I played, and we'll be talking about them in future weeks. I had a great time at our live show. I had a great time at the Battling Tops Tournament, almost won it, ah, but that is what it is. Okay, well, um, Thanksgiving in America is happening this week, so a lot of interesting you know, fun events for us here. I also want to give a shout out here. I should have done this uh, two weeks ago, but R.A. Montgomery passed away on November 9th. And I just, uh, he was the guy who created the Choose Your Own Adventure books. And I think that those had some bearing on much of what you see in a game. A book that lets you choose your own adventure, a game that lets you choose what you do next. Either way, those books were a big influence on me as a kid. And so thank you, sir. Okay, well, it looks like it's time for the news. Only a few pieces of news, actually. Uh, the Descent campaign book, a new one, is coming out. This is going to work with the second edition of Descent. So you only need the base game to play this. It's called um, The Heirs of Blood. Ooh. Um, but it seems like a ton more scenarios. So if you have Descent and you're like, oh, what expansion do I buy first? You can just buy this book and it gives you a lot more different scenarios that you can have show up in different games. Uh, a new expansion for Castle Panic has been announced, Dark Titan, which actually has a mega monster who you have to fight as the monsters come in. Uh, Castle Panic is a very popular cooperative game where monsters are rushing in you to fight off this guy. And then, in the, probably the biggest news of the year, board gaming wise, Asmodee and Board Game Geek have merged together. Um, Asmodee has acquired. Um, did I say Board Game Geek? Asmodee and Fantasy Flight. That'd be a very different news story. Asmodee and Fantasy Flight have merged together. Um, the uh, Asmodee has acquired Fantasy Flight. Christian Peterson is still in charge of Fantasy Flight and is also a, uh, a stockholder now with Asmodee. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in Tom Thinks section later on, but this has certainly caused a lot of waves in the board game world. Okay, we have a small shelf that we're looking at today, but um, and small games on it. This is some Hero Escape Train. Forbidden Island, which is a great game. Even though I like Forbidden Desert better, Forbidden Island is such a great game to teach kids and to, or even people who are new to the hobby. Uh, very much enjoy it. Call of Glory is a simple card game. In fact, it came out in many different versions. There was a chicken version, a car version from Simply Fun. Call of Glory is one of the nicest versions. It's a simple card game. I like it best with two and three. Here we have Werewolf Inquisition. Now, interestingly enough, I really do enjoy this. This is kind of a variant on Werewolf. I don't know how much longer it will stay in my collection because I seem to play One Night Ultimate Werewolf more often. David and Goliath, one of the best trick-taking games ever designed. There are a lot of different forms it comes in, but man, do I enjoy that. This one here is Mogul. Mogul is actually being reprinted. Um, this is a kind of a cool box. It was one of three different boxes put together. Mogul has a very neat auction mechanism, which you see a little bit of in No Thanks later on, uh, but just a solid game. Fantasy Business, this is from the Blue Box line, which is no longer around, but Fantasy Business, you are selling weapons and things that other people are selling, hopefully for the cheapest price. 
Roll Through the Ages, a great game about rolling dice and building a civilization. Very light, though, and even lighter than that underneath it. This Columbia game here is Slapshot. Slapshot is a hockey game where you're drafting the best players. Think of it as kind of a fancy game of war. It's not very strategic, but man, is it silly fun. And Botswana, which has been called many different names. Um, Loco is probably the most famous version of it. But this is the eagle version with the animals. has plastic animals in it. And, and just very much enjoy it. Most of these are simple games. Uh, Mogul is probably the heaviest here because there's stocks involved. Uh, but I take it very seriously, and David and Goliath when I play that. Um, so these are very solid games, a great game shelf. Hello, and welcome to The Discriminating Gamer, the board game review show that really hates it when you call at 4 a.m. and ask it if its Android net is running. My name is Cody, and we're seeing a lot of games these days that are including apps. Um, I'm talking about Gollum Arcana, uh, The Alchemist, the forthcoming uh, XCOM board game. And I think like a lot of people, as we're seeing this kind of app wave take over board gaming, we're kind of wondering, is this a good thing? Is it going to, is it just a fad? Or is it going to really affect the way we play games? And if I buy a game that uses an app, am I going to be able to play that game, you know, 5, 10, 20 years down the line? Will that technology still be available? Instead of having the apps be essential for gameplay, I'd really like to see apps that supplement bookkeeping in, in, in games. That, to me, is, is, is just the, the perfect avenue. You know, when you're playing a game of, of the actual PC game, Sid Meier's Civilization, it's cool how the computer just takes care of everything for you. Wouldn't it be great if we had stuff like that for board games? Now, I know there are a few out there. Zombie Side, Arkham Horror had kind of a toolkit thing, and those things were fun, but I'm talking about some real, real good apps that can help you. Could you imagine playing a game of Twilight Imperium and having something take care of your tech, take care of your planets? I mean, this this would be awesome. Wouldn't it be great if you had an app for something like Clash of Cultures with, with the, you know, tracking your resources and your tech? I mean, there's so many applications that would work really well with integrating apps for bookkeeping purposes in board games. So that's just kind of what I wanted to rant about today, and that's where I would like to see apps go for board games in the future. Well, that's my rant for today on The Discriminating Gamer, and I just want to tell you that... Look, a penguin! Can somebody help me? I'm on my feet again! And I don't... Stefan Dora's intrigue is set in the world of 17th century academia. I know, crazy, right? Bear with me. Each player owns a university that needs to be staffed with useful professors. The catch is, you can't hire your own people. Nepotism's no good in this game. So what you need to do is wheel and deal with the other players to make sure that your family and friends get hired for the best positions while your university gets all the staff that it needs. A brand new game that uses negotiation in the form of bribery is The Sheriff of Nottingham. Players are outlaws traveling through Sherwood Forest and trying to get through the woods with all their contraband. Every time they run into the sheriff, the sheriff is going to ask them what's in their bag. They have to tell, but they don't have to tell the truth. And where the negotiation comes in is you can bribe the sheriff not to take too close a look at what you've got in your bags, or if you're feeling vindictive, you can bribe the sheriff to take a really close look at what someone else has in their bags. Sheriff of Nottingham is sure to be a bullseye with anyone looking for a hot new game that involves bluffing, bribery, and negotiation. Pit has been around for over a hundred years, hence the very different looking packaging. Players are dealt an equal portion of the deck, and your job is to trade away stuff that you don't want so that you can collect all the cards of one particular good. Players will hold up a number of cards that they want to get rid of, and they have to all be the same kind, and they will yell out the number of cards they're trading. Three, 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 etc. Anyone else who's trading the same number of cards can make a swap. Hopefully, you get the right thing and you get what you need, and hopefully, you don't give someone else enough cards to corner the market. At 110 years old, Pitt is certainly not showing its age. This is a true classic. Unlike some of those classics out there, this one is definitely worth playing. Hey folks, Tom Basil here. Jason Levine. Today our question is, 
what do you do when you have someone in your game group who's, um, for, for lack of a better word, they're not very good at games. They, they, they're like, oh, and they make really bad moves. They ruin games. They're just not, they have ADD. They're not paying attention. But they're really fun and nice to be around. And so you play like a big game like in Resistance and they accidentally reveal that they're the one of the, you know, they're one of the corporation. Um, so then you say, okay, we'll split up into small groups. But everyone's like, I don't want to play with this person. <laughs> okay, now we don't necessarily have anyone in our, in our gaming group like that currently. Um, but there have been people in our gaming group before um, where people haven't wanted to play with them. I've, I've come across a situation before yeah. where it's kind of like, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we already have four people. Oh, yeah. sorry. And then so that is a tough one to deal with. I think, um, wow, uh, you know. Well, I know I try to pick games that are more on the level of, you know, easier games that people aren't going to make mistakes on. Or if it's a more complex game, I try to, like, guide people as we go and show them, like, well, if you do this, it'll be better for you for this reason. And try to help people out so they understand how to pick up deeper games. It's really a tough one. I mean, you, there, there may be a point where you have to sit the person down and say, hey, you know, you're not paying attention. You're on your phone all the time, and then you don't know the rules when we're playing this game. That's ruined for everybody else, and no one really wants to play with you because of that. Sometimes that kind of get a, a shock treatment might help them out. Um, although no one likes to hear that, and it's a tough thing to do, to pull someone aside like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if that doesn't work, and the person just isn't all together when it comes to games, and they want to come, and you like having them come, then you just split into smaller groups, and each group, each time, it's someone's turn to have that person in their group. Exactly, and you know... Bite the bullet. People are more important than games. Yeah, and then just, like I say, play simpler games. If you play simple games, you know, play games like... Uh, apples to Apples or Dixit. Or well, that's super like, simple, but yeah. yeah. But those are games that you can play with people who aren't going to pay attention in a deeper game. You just play games that you don't have to worry about people making, you know, oh, you did that dumb move that screwed up everyone else. And you don't have to worry about that if you play games that are more on the level of someone that could handle a game like that. I think we're going to need some answers in the comments here because this is a unique thing. And again, we're not trying to say, oh, well, we're so much better than this person. But there are some disruptive people who are kind of like a whirlwind of chaos and uncertainty, and you're like, they're very nice people, but they keep messing games up that they're in, and they keep like, I, I haven't figured this out, and it's the 10th time you played it. Um, <laughs> so how do you deal with that? I love to see comments in the sections. Anyway, yeah. until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Okay, today we're taking a look at the Boar Cube. Yeah, the Boar Cube. This thing is mega. This is my hand on top of it. A very solid uh, piece here. Although there is a lot of empty space and otherwise it would be too tight. If I put a light behind it, you should hopefully be able to see a little bit of the, you can see how there's green in there. So I love to get a light inside this thing, but be that as it may, it's just mega. So this is for people who like to play Star Trek Attack Wing. Uh, with a, you can see there's some, a giant board that goes underneath. Uh, I believe the base fits on any of the six sides. It also comes with um, a, some cards. Here it shows the maneuvers of the card. This thing has, it's probably more maneuverable than any other ship in the game, which is makes sense since it's 82 points. And of course, everybody's gonna wanna put Locutus on the ship. So there's a whole pile of cards with extra rules. I don't think you'll see this used in a lot of games. Probably more likely it'll be in more people's collections like mine sitting on a shelf. But if you want the Boar Cube, this is gonna dwarf the ships that you play with. It certainly adds a new dimension to the game. And another item that's interesting, Daedalus Productions made me these nice coasters that I mean, they're with the Dice Tower logo on them. These are really thick coasters, too. I have other coasters that are much thinner than this. Uh, these are, are, are really good quality. So, anyhow, Daedalus is making a lot of cool stuff. Thought you guys might want to see that. Now we're going to be taking a look at a brand new segment uh, to the show. I love talking to designers and publishers. And so we're going to have a real short segment where each week we talk to a different designer and publisher and ask them either... What is their most favorite game or the game that's most influenced them that they did not design or publish? So these are real short, but I think it'd be interesting to see what designers like.
Uh, game that most influenced me was and is Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, I was 11 years old. I was at summer camp, and I heard people playing it and saw it and it blew my mind because here was a game where you could do anything, you could tell a story. Uh, got way into it, did a lot of DMing, and then what I learned from D&D or role playing in general is you get to change the game how you like. Don't like a rule? Change it. Uh, forget a rule? Like fudge it. And being a DM all through my teens is what really got my brain around how to put together a game, how to make a fun game experience, what rules were needed, what rules weren't needed, how to balance things out and make it all fair. slightly lighter this week from the Dice Tower, and I apologize for that. Most of that's because I need to take a small vacation this week. Uh, well, Thanksgiving is here, and I just want to spend some time with my family. We are going to put out a few reviews. You're also going to see a new top 10 show up this week, so that's a big production anyway. And then we're going to be posting our live show that we recorded at BoardGameGeek.com with some hitherto things that have never happened in the show happening at this show. Craziness, craziness, I tell you. Uh, so keep a, keep a look out for those things. And of course, all our podcasts at uh, DiceTowerNetwork.com. Uh, we'll be posting the Dice Tower show on our audio feed also. So if you just want to listen to the show, you can do that there also. Hey, that's about it for Dice Tower Productions. Let's go visit Chaz. Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise, and it's just about that time of year when people from all over the world come together as one to count down arbitrary things from the past 12 months. I'd like to take this opportunity to present mine, Chaz's official top and bottom three games of 2014. These games gave me the biggest surprises and disappointments when I played them for the first time this year. All right. <clears throat> Let's start off at the tail end of the list with disappointing game number three, Dread Curse. In Dread Curse, players take on the variety of pirate roles in an attempt to amass the most doubloons. Each round, your role in the pirate crew and corresponding special power may change, so be sure to take advantage of your character's ability while you have it. At the end of the game, the player with the largest fortune wins, but... Beware the black spot, because if you end up with this cursed coin, you automatically lose. Now, my game group really enjoys deduction, roll selection, and hidden roll type games. So, when I introduced them to Dread Curse, oh, I expected them to shower me with applause and thank you cards. But, to be fair, I expect that response to most everything I do. But instead, it was met with confusion caused by rules and timing conflicts, and, and the answers we were looking for weren't always well documented, so we had to come up with house rules right there on the fly. Now, I could see Dread Curse becoming a lot more fun after two or three more plays, after you get used to it and have a plan for dealing with rules, ambiguity, and conflicts. And I would be willing to play Dread Curse again, and I'd like to, but I haven't had a chance to get this one to the table again yet. And that's why Dread Curse is number three in my list of disappointing games that I played for the first time this year. But next time, we'll lighten the mood with one of the best new game experiences that I had in 2014. Aha! Hello, we're the Board Gamers. My name's Greg. And I'm Jim, and we're here today to talk about replayability in games. Yes, as you can see behind us, we have our, our unique mechanic uh, that we uh, use and uh, utilize on our show called the Boardometer. The which, Boardometer, uh, yes. Tells us how replayable a game is. So there are some good games that are terribly unreplayable, and uh, vice versa. Um, it would be very, very easy in this case to talk about um, great games that are replayable and uh, bad games that are terribly unreplayable. But uh, we'd like to talk about good games that are replayable and also good games that are not so much. So um, the two examples of very replayable games we have here today is uh, Robinson Crusoe by Z-Man Games <laughs> oh, and uh, Thunderstone Advance by AEG. Both this exceedingly uh, heavy boxes. Um, yes. uh, both fantastic games in my opinion anyway, but yes. uh, amazingly replayable um, just, just by the sheer amount of things you can do. You have uh, Robinson Crusoe, you have six scenario cards and each one of them is like reinventing the game. It's absolutely stunning. Um, 
and uh, Thunderstone Advance, uh, literally down to the uh, randomizer element of all the uh, the things you can pick up and deck build with. Oh, there's so many cards. It's it makes just crazy. it massively yeah. replayable. Yes, incredibly replayable. And that's you know that's how we sort of rate our games, not just a star rating, but we look at how boring they are. If they're very replayable, we put it in the green element of our boardometer, and if they're not replayable at all, we put it in the red and say no, you want to throw it away as soon as you played it once. So one of the less replayable games uh, we're going to be talking about is 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 uh, Cards Against Humanity, which um, fantastic game. Um, but the problem is is even though you've got plenty of cards to play with, especially with expansions, when you play with a few different people a few times, certain words and certain uh, things really do sort of trigger the, uh, the the laughs every single time. In fact, they're always the irreverent and very very wrong words to get it. Like always wins. Yep. Or like. Gamers, I'm Kylie the Nerdy Girl here with three of my favorite gaming websites so that way we can play more games because we use the internet and we can play them anywhere. First, we have Gaming Table Online. This is a website that has games like Making of the President, which you can't even buy, so it's great. You go there. The one downside is sometimes you're waiting a while for the game. Next, a German site called Brit the Spiel, something like that. I know I murdered the demon. The link is going to be up there. You can't miss it. So when you go there, there's lots of people, thousands of players, you can almost get into anything, anytime, and the selection is huge. And then my favorite one, personally, Board Game Arena. I go there almost all the time, many of my favorite games are there. Takinoko, Through the Ages, Puerto Rico, Race for the Galaxy, Seasons. Many of these games, I first played them there, I love them so much, I actually went out, bought them so I can bring them and play them with my gaming group in person. So, it's an amazing site to go to. Don't think just because you're playing it online, you're actually seeing it from the developers, because many people, myself included, we go there, we find out we love the game. After you try it a little bit, you actually go out and you make that purchase, because sometimes you don't want to spend $50 on a game if you don't know if you're going to like it, and this is one of the ways i found that you can get the definitive answer if you like it. I find this is great because in our busy lives, everything is going digital. Why not bring our board gaming digital? You lose a little bit, obviously, of that table experience, but if you just want some of the games, it helps you get that in. Now obviously, two minutes, I couldn't mention every site I love. In the comments below, why don't you fill it up with some sites I don't know, some sites I overlooked, and I hope you go and play more games, and may RNG always be in your favor. So Fantasy Flight and Asthma Day are merging. Oh no, the sky is falling, and I mean, wow! The number of people who are complained and up in arms about this seems to be quite a few on the internet. And I feel like most of the people um, are, are uninformed. And I don't mean that in a negative way and, and, or condescending, but I feel that it's bad form, first of all, to look at any event and say, oh, it's going to destroy everything. Come on now. Give things a chance, first of all, and also look them over. People say, oh, this worries me, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I, I just don't understand that. This, folks, I think is a great thing. And there are some really good uh, predictions that we can see in the future. Now, I'm not worried about predictions like, oh no, now we're gonna see X-Wing Kemet and we're gonna see Star Wars, you know, Cold Express and mixing in things. Well, that, that's not how it works. Asmodee is owned by a much, much larger company. Asmodee is only a small percentage of that, while Asmodee themselves or a very large board game company. And with Fantasy Flight now in the portfolio, they're certainly probably the biggest in the hobby game market, period. And that's not a horrible thing. It's not like they're stomping out all the competition. All you have to do is go to Board Game Geek Con, to Gen Con, to Origins, to Essen, to see that while Asmodee certainly has a presence there, it's not even half of what's there. There are tons of other companies out there. Secondly, all these companies were once small. These companies were small companies. I remember when Fantasy Flight first was starting, they were this dinky company that made Twilight Imperium. And now look where they are. And that's exciting because that means that there are small companies right now that are out there that are going to grow and be big and interesting in the future. 
You know, Hasbro and Mattel have had a stranglehold on the game industry for such a long time. They've been putting garbage out there. Now, they put out some good games here and there, thanks to a few people like Rob Davio, who you saw earlier, and Craig Van Ness and, and uh, Mike Gray and others. But for the most part, they've just been pumping trash out. People are buying it. Why would we be upset that now there is a hobby game company that's big enough that maybe can throw its weight around and get some these really good games into stores? Also, and this is something that you may not know, distributors and stores are excited about this because there are really good facets to both Fantasy Flight and to Asthma Day. One of those is the games get out there. The games come. There is a, a game is coming and it's released. They have great distribution across the world. And sure, they hit snags when a game is super popular like X-Wing, you know, keeping those in stock and such. But their games are out there. And both companies are incredibly good quality games. Uh, just this week, before the news even hit, on Monday, we did a live Q&A, me and Jason, and someone asked, you know, what, what, what's your favorite company? And I don't really have a favorite company because I'm, I, I have good friends in all these companies. I love what the, many of them they're doing. But if I said if I bought a game sight unseen from a company, it might be Asmodee or Fantasy Flight. Well, now they're together. Also, look at history. Asmodee has many companies that it works with, sometimes in a small way, sometimes they just distribute their games, sometimes they own them. I mean, there's lots of different companies. There's Matigo and Ludonat and um, Bombix and, and, and each of these companies, many of these companies, they have different sorts of relationships with Asmodee and it's been phenomenal. Look at the games that they've been producing. This year, when you ask people what their favorite games are, wow, the games, are, many of them are being mentioned from Asmodee and or Fantasy Flight. So they've said there's no worry about diluting the brand. It's not like you're gonna see X-Wing go all over everything. In fact, I talked to the employees of Fantasy Flight when I was at Board Game Geek Con and they were thrilled with what was going on. There's no job losses, no, no nothing changing. Fantasy Flight is just working as a branch with Asmodee, still producing the great things and able to focus on the games that they do well, which are the thematic Amara Thrash games that are there. Asmodee is going to work with them just like they work with all the other different companies that are putting out games. This is great for everyone. So, sure, you can sit there with the doom and gloom, oh, it's bad for the industry, pushing out the little guys, when that hasn't even remotely happened. Name one company that went out of business because of this. Baloney! None did. Name one company that suddenly is like, oh, because they merge, that's going to hurt us more. No, no one is. But your friendly local game stores, which many of you say, oh, we love them. Well, then be glad for them because this is good for them. For us as the consumer to see high quality games. Look at my shelf here. Libertalia, a great high quality game from Asthma Day. Abyss, a great high quality game from Asthma Day. Here is where Imperial Salt should be, but it's out, it's out for now. From Fantasy Flight, um, here's Battle Lore from Fantasy Flight, and Tribune, which was made by Fantasy Flight, and Eldritch Horror from Fantasy Flight. Why would I be upset about this? It's like mom and dad got back together again. Well, I don't know if they were ever together in the first place. Okay, so whatever. Go out, doom and gloom. I don't, I don't really mind people yell, but for me, I think this is an exciting time to be in the hobby. There are plenty of other board game companies that are climbing up the ladder, trying to get a piece of the pie. This is not stifling creativity. In fact, I think it's gonna allow for even more. Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be looking at some promos for uh, a couple of games because I know a lot of people aren't certain about what promos actually are and what to expect from a promo. So let's take a look. The first one here is for Alhambra and it's called the uh, the Machisan Chabawa, which is basically the magic buildings in English, but you can see it comes in uh, German and Italian and English and uh, French rules. So you got rules for all the different languages on little sheets of paper and uh, these are all double sided. The rules are very very straightforward and that's something that you'll notice about promos is they very seldom are complicated to implement but um, yeah so here we go. So so these promos on average you can either get for free at a trade show or you'll pick, up, pick them up afterwards for five dollars at the Board Game Geek store which is what I did. So let's take a look at Alhambra the Magic Buildings. So I'm just going to flip this tile over here and we can see that we have six little building tiles, one in each of the six different colors. And uh, what makes the, this promo unique is that when you pull these tiles out, 
you can actually rotate them before placing them. And you'll see they're a bit more expensive than regular buildings, but that's why. The next promo I'm going to show you are these two mini promos for Tolkien, the Mayan calendar. So um, <clears throat> you can see it's basically two new monument tiles and two new starting wealth tiles and they're from Czech Games Edition. And that that's basically all there is to it. So you see these promos, they don't... They're not gonna, you, you'll never really get a promo that will dramatically change the game. They'll do that kind of thing in an expansion. A promo is something that they want to just add, that you can chuck into the game box that makes it like a little bit different. It's a tiny bit of variety, but it's not going to change the mechanics in any seriously dramatic way. Last promo I'm going to show you is for the game Machi Koro, and this is the Gaming Mega Store. So this is a new sort of building that you can build into your city in Machi Koro. You see it's just a little shrink wrap pack of cards. So it's like you roll a 10. It's a purple building. You may choose to activate another one of your non black like purple establishments in place of this one on your turn. If you do, return this card to the market. And that costs seven. So you see, the cool thing about promos is while they are nice, they're not going to break the game. Well, they shouldn't break the game. But that should give you a fairly decent introduction to promos and what you can expect when you're buying a promo. Um, so thanks for watching and take care. Bye bye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this week. To all those in the United States of America, a super happy Thanksgiving to you. And I like this part of year to always say thank you to those in the Dice Tower guys. We have a lot of folks in the Dice Tower that you don't see things go on behind the scenes. Okay, I have Robert Searing, who has been an incredible help behind the scenes working on the website for the Dice Tower. And yes, we're still working on the new version, And but he's done a great job also helping out with the news. And I have a great team of people working with him on both the news website and on the audio website. So big thank you to all of you guys. I have people who take the audio version of Board Game uh, Breakfast and put that online. I have people who help me with all the different podcasts. A big thank you to them. A big thank you to my co-host, Eric Summer, my video co-host, Jason Levine, Sam Healy, Z Garcia, all the video reviewers who come on the channel, all the contributors, some you didn't see this week, like Suzanne, because she was at Board Game Geek Gun, or Jared Whitley, who were there, but these contributors who consistently put out great stuff. Um, and so a big thank you to everybody who's in any part of the Dice Tower. With, of course, the biggest thank you being to my wife for allowing me to do this. And then at, right after her and my kids are you guys. You guys have been a great audience. Thank you so much. It's time to go eat some turkey, I think, this week. But also to play some games. A lot of games are going to get played this week. While you're watching me, go start playing. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.